But again, welcome everybody to our unconscious bias session. I know that you all have been um, sort of continually uh, in dialogue within a, a conference with each other this month. It seems like you've had a lot of sessions being offered to you. Um, thankful for the opportunity to be able to join you all. Um, I'm actually going to stop sharing really quick just to introduce myself via web webcam and give my colleague Terrence a chance to introduce himself. All right. Um, sorry. All right. Um, so again, welcome everybody. Um, Oh, Terrence, somebody's saying they are having trouble hearing me. Are other people able to hear? Looks like it's fine for Janine. Yeah, I can hear you fine. Okay. Uh, it sounds good. Janice, I don't know if you have control of your um, like volume. Maybe you can try to turn your volume up. And one other suggestion is uh, if you go down to the mute button, uh, there's a little icon next to it and click that icon and she may not be able to hear us, but it will show you where your system is pointing. And you may have to select something different, different output. Okay. Yeah, um, I got a message. It looks like they were able to, um, to figure it out. All right, so again, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Generic Holmes. I am the Associate Director of the Racial Justice Institute at the Shriver Center for Poverty Law. Um, happy to be with you all today. Um, I guess just sort of a quick plug for RJI. Uh, we just wrapped up the 2020 Institute uh, last week. I'm anxious to uh, bring in another family and we'll be dropping the application for 2021 next January. Um, so if after today's session, you are interested in applying or just learning more um, please do send me your email address. You can send it privately in the chat pod if you want um, or follow up with me afterward and I can put you on our inquiry list just to make sure that you get the information about next year's cohort. And with that, I'm gonna pass it off to my colleague Terrence to introduce himself. Hello everyone, Terrence O'Neill. I'm the Director of Online Learning here at the Shriver Center and uh, I will be running the, uh, the session today. I'm looking forward to working with you all today. I'm coming to you from just outside of Boston where I'm looking out my window. It's 34 degrees out and we have a full on snowstorm. <laughs> so we're expecting a couple of inches of snow here today. So I guess uh, we'll just have to deal with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I should have shared that I'm uh, kind of, I'm dialing in from Brooklyn. I was really surprised that it, it's so cold today, so here we are. Okay. Slides back up. All right, so very quickly, wanna review our objectives for today's session. You know, today we're gonna to be discussing implicit bias. Um, we're gonna discuss um, those cognitive processes and how our brain can play tricks on us. Um, and before we know it, we have kind of developed these stereotypes and attitudes and associations about particular groups of people. Um, so by the end of the session, you'll be able to describe an example of your own implicit biases. Um, we're also gonna talk about this notion of stereotype threat and identity anxiety uh, and how those can impact our job performance negatively. Um, how it can impact our relationships with our colleagues. Um, and then finally, we are going to move on to discuss uh, how to mitigate bias and how we can apply filters at different parts in a process uh, to hopefully uh, reach more equitable outcomes. Um, and then after we've discussed those techniques, um, we'll kind of move into small groups uh, to do some work with devising techniques around the hiring process. So 
really quickly, these are our core practices within the uh, Racial Justice Institute. Um, and I really just want to discuss right now how social cognition and implicit bias kind of layer on top of uh, Kim's structural racialization presentation from yesterday, for those of you who were with us there. Um, so really want to situate this within those four levels. Um, and if you were with us yesterday, you know, Kim discussed how structural racialization, how the system we're seeing here is a framework for understanding an array of historical practices, policies, dynamics in our history, right? That um, kind of uh, continue to provide advantage for whites um, and continue to disadvantage people of color. So, you know, as we always say, you can't always point out a specific malicious, like explicitly racist character within a system or a structure. And yet um, our systems, like our criminal justice system, our housing system, our education system, um, really continue to perpetuate all of these inequities. Uh, and if you think about Mrs. Perez from yesterday's video, uh, she, as she was written, was not explicitly racist, uh, but her guidance counselor role in the education system and the way that her hands were tied, to use her language, uh, was going to cause another Black boy to not get the prerequisites that he needed um, to advance. Uh, so if you think about Mrs. Perez, her colleagues, the principals, the superintendent, the DOE, kind of like laddering up this model, that we're seeing here, uh, the way that we talk about it and the way that we view it in RJI, all of those decisions, most uh, within all of those decisions, most of all of the bias is really being sort of inserted at the unconscious level. Um, and so we say this uh, system and spheres of systemic racialization are really kind of undergirded by implicit bias. And that's a little bit of what we're gonna be sort of unpacking today. So I wanna start by setting a bit of context around the importance of these concepts. Um, you know, we will go deeper into defining these terms um, shortly. Um, and we'll also have time to discuss them in small groups uh, and discuss how all of this impacts us as advocates. Um, you know, I think we're very used to describing bias outside of the doors of our organizations, but don't often get a chance to discuss um, how bias might manifest and impact our interactions with our clients and our communities, um, and also how it might inform our interactions among um, ourselves and those who we supervise and manage. Um, and we'll have time to discuss that today. So I wanna start by kind of grounding us um, in these principles and concepts around uh, social cognition and implicit bias. Uh, so first off, there are two kinds of bias, right? There's explicit bias and there's implicit bias. Um, so explicit bias refers to the attitudes and beliefs that we have about a person or group on a conscious level we are aware of it, it's controllable, it's intentional, and it's endorsed. And as such, explicit biases can be regulated and changed uh, because we do have that control over them. But then implicit bias refers to the brain's automatic instant association of stereotypes or attitudes towards particular groups without our conscious awareness. Um, so the human brain is kind of an amazing thing, right? Um, it can process about uh, 11 million pieces of data per second um, unconsciously. Um, so consciously, we're really only aware of about 40 bits of data per second. So it's really almost as if um, those two parts of our brains are speaking a different language. Uh, sensory input passes through your unconscious uh, before you're aware of it. It goes through filters, it gets adjusted. And what you see and what you hear are really based on your life experience. Uh, none of us experiences the world firsthand. We all receive information through our senses. 
uh, through these filters. And so in order to make sense of that incredible volume of data um, that we encounter from day to day, our brains organize it into schemas and mental shortcuts. So we sort things into categories. We begin to create associations between things and we fill in gaps when uh, we only have partial information, which really leads to us reacting before we even realize it. So we're gonna briefly take a look at some um, quick activities that help us understand and further understand brain science and social cognition. And so Terrence is gonna display a poll for us. Um, and when he does, I want you to tell me um, in which direction you're seeing this figure spin. I'll just give you a moment to take this. So which way is she doing clockwise, counterclockwise, or change directions? Change directions. Get it up yet. Mm -hmm. All right, so we got some answers coming in. Seems like most people see the figure moving clockwise. It's changed direction for um, about 18% of you. It's funny, I found that I can kind of get it to change directions for me if I um, stare at the shadow. Um, I don't know, it's kind of interesting. All right, so it looks like most of you see the figure moving clockwise. Um, it changed directions for some people, uh, moving counterclockwise for others. And really, you know, there's no change in direction uh, of the figure of the woman on the screen, right? The illusion of her spinning um, or even changing directions is a function of our brains. So this is a great example of how all of us here can be looking at the exact same image um, but um, come to different conclusions about what it is that we're seeing. Like we're uh, kind of experiencing these different realities, uh, even though we're looking at the exact same thing. Uh, yeah, that sure looked like it changed. Right? Sure, she did. Mm -hmm. right. All right, so I'm going to end this poll. Um, all right, and Terrence is now gonna play a video for us. Let me stop sharing. And what I'm gonna ask you to do as you watch the video is to jot down and count the number of passes that the team and white makes. Uh, I'm having just a little technical issue. Just a sec, please. Let me try this again. Did that work generic? Because I'm having a little technical issue. Yeah, there was no sound, um, but it but it worked. Do you want me to play it? Yeah, you might want to try. I'm 
for some reason or other, I'm unfortunately not getting the sound. Okay, hold on. If you could stop sharing. Yeah, sorry about this, folks. <laughs> Oh, good. Maybe some gremlins in our system for our spooky presentation today. Um, Side clicks in a second. Sorry. All right. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? All right, so how many passes did the team in white make? If you could share that with me in the chat pod. I'm just gonna keep this video up since it took so long to get it situated. All right, so we've got varying answers here. Um, looks like anywhere from nine to 13. Thank you for, uh, for answering me here. Um, so, <laughs> so how many of you, um, saw the, the, the dancing bear come through the back of the screen? I see some people have already noted it. For those who did see it, um, have you seen this video before? Yeah, looks like some of you have. Um, all right, well, let me finish playing the video so that um, those of you who didn't see it um, can look for it this time. The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? Right. So what's happening for us there, right? Um, we saw the bear clearly the second time through, um, but then obviously some of us missed it the first time. So just like on a cognitive level, um, does anybody want to unmute and share like what they think is, what they think is going on there? I was thinking, this is a call, I was thinking the conversation that we had and the information that you gave us to count how many uh, uh, the white uh, being passed that we focus our mind on that particular thing and not looking for abstraction in the group. And I think that's the reason why that, I did, as a matter of fact, I didn't pay attention to the bear or even recognize it as being a bear. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it, right? Like you were primed to watch for that team in white and the count, and you had an activity associated with them, right? To count the number of passes that they made. So um, so you kind of 
weren't really aware of uh, the surroundings, right? Correct. Yeah, Hi. yeah. Um, this is Natalie Bogerman. Um, I also think it just shows you um, your attention might not be what you think it is. Just that like you're concentrating on one thing and you know something totally else is going on and you just you know don't see it. Right, right. And think about the implications for that in our society, right? Where we've been instructed to sort of scrutinize certain groups of people who look a certain way, right? And pay more attention to their behavior rather than others. Um, let me share my screen again. All right, so we're gonna do a couple of more quick activities. Um, so what I'm gonna have you do here um, is actually read this aloud with me. I've never done this with such a large group of people, but I think we'll just be fine. Um, and I don't know, you can mute or unmute. Um, I'll sort of leave it up to your discretion. Um, but want to see how um, easy or hard this is for us, right? Um, so I'm going to get it started. Only smart Only people smart can people read this. Can read this. Couldn't believe that I could, that I could actually understand what I was reading. Phenomenal power of the human mind, according to a researcher at Cambridge University. This is because the human mind does not read every letter by itself, but the word as a whole. Amazing, huh? Yeah, and I always thought spelling was important. Yeah, and I always thought spelling was important. <laughs> so, um, you know, our brains are, again, these amazing, um, these amazing things. and when information is missing, we can often just sort of fill in the gaps. And also we can just kind of fill in gaps based on our historical understanding. Um, like you sort of look at these groupings of words, uh, letters, and you um, can kind of organize them into the word that you're pretty sure that it should be, right? So this is our final test together and um, I'm gonna, have you do this aloud with me also, and just uh, state the color of the text that you're seeing. If you can read Greek, this won't work as well <laughs> for you. Um, there's always like a few of you at every training, um, but for the rest <laughs> of you, this will be really uh, interesting. Um, all right, so. Green. 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 Red. Red. Orange. 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 Blue, 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 navy, yellow, yellow, yellow purple, purple, black, black, black red, 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 orange. Okay, so this is like fairly simple for us, right? Um, and let me transition us to the next slide. And we're gonna do this again. Um, purple, blue. blue. Red, red, green, green, black, green, green, red, black, green, red, black, green, red, black, green, green, black, green, black, green, green, black, red, black, green, black, so this, is, <laughs> so this is more difficult for us, right? And why is that? Why is this? Why was it more difficult this time when it was in sort of um, our native tongue than when it was written in Greek? Because we're reading it and seeing it. Because <laughs> we're reading it and seeing it? Um, it's causing a conflict. associate the word with a color. The word mm -hmm. we're reading with a color. Right, right. So this really speaks to uh, cognitive dissonance, right? Uh, it's like when we're trying to do something that's at odds with kind of like our subconscious process and a construct that we've been um, taught around like a word or a phrase, right? When we think of um, black, we associate a specific color of it. And that's the same with all of these other words, right? I, I don't understand that. You say when you associate black, you associate with the rest of the colors? Yeah, so I mean, this is really just trying to show us 
that, um, you know, we've really just been taught to see things in a certain way, right? Um, we, uh, I mean, colors and to some extent are basically like uh, a construct, just like races. Like the, the, the word black could describe red, but it doesn't, right? Um, like we ascribe meaning to things as a society. Um, and so at this point in our lives, um, when we hear the word black, we think about the color black. When we hear the word red, we think about the color red. Um, and I think really the importance of this for us, um, let me flip ahead, is um, just kind of proving um, that at a subconscious level, like, we do actually see race, right? We do see color. Uh, you know, we're sort of in this, since Obama, I feel like there's just sort of been this narrative that we are in like a post-racial society uh, and we're not supposed to see race. We don't see color. Um, but as that test just showed us, it can really be difficult to um, push yourself past the dominant narratives, the dominant constructs that you've been taught about certain groups. Um, so we, you know, subconsciously, unconsciously think about race, even though, even when we kind of don't explicitly discuss it. Uh, and our race schemas around all of those constructs may be activated without our awareness. Um, and even though we may fight them, like we were sort of trying to do during that Stroop test, during that exercise, um, it's kind of hard for us to push past that cognitive dissonance um, because bias and it just resides within us. Carl, does that make sense? Yes. Yes, thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks for that question. So, you know, now that we've done some activities and experienced some of the ways our brain plays tricks on us, um, now we're gonna explore the impact uh, that these tricks have. Right? So as we said earlier, our brains find schemas and shortcuts for processing the millions of bits of information that are presented, presented to us like minute by minute. Um, and one way that the brain does this is through stereotypes and attitudes. Um, and so stereotypes are traits that we associate with a category and attitudes are evaluative feelings that are positive or negative. Um, and I think one important thing to note about stereotypes is that stereotypes can be um, sometimes presented as positive, sometimes presented as a compliment, um, but can really still have a negative impact because what we're doing, we're still sort of invalidating somebody's individual, individual experience or individual identity um, and trying to group them together. Um, and you know, uh, some common stereotypes that fall into that category are, um, you know, so like, all black people can dance. Uh, Asians are really good at math. Um, can anybody think of any others that fall into that category? Maybe some that apply to you that you've heard too many times? I'm a white woman, we cry a lot. Mm, yeah. Although, yeah. unfortunately, that, that actually might be true. <laughs> well, I mean, Ang angry oh, black woman. Dizzy. Angry black woman. That one comes up a lot. And we will have time, I think, to sort of flesh that one out a little bit more, too, during um, our discussion about stereotype threat and identity anxiety. Um, but that comes up a lot for our colleagues of color, um, you know, I work with a lot of black women um, and, you know, they sort of share that they routinely um, kind of have to check themselves because they don't want to confirm that um, stereotype threat. Like they don't want to um, come off as the angry black woman in a meeting. Um, right. Yeah, yeah, so. We understand that. And we'll um, have more time to talk about these as we um, spend more time together today. Thanks for sharing that. Um, so where do these stereotypes and attitudes come from? Um, it really starts around infancy, right? We 
um, get messages from our parents, from our friends, from the media. Uh, and we begin to kind of build these in groups and out groups based on that information. Uh, and before we know it, we began to develop these positive or negative associations with these different groups. Um, all of that sort of strengthens over time uh, and its seeds of implicit bias are planted. Um, and I think this media one is important to focus in on here um, just because we're inundated with so many messages about so many types of people. Um, and if you think for instance about, uh, take a show like Cops, right? Which like in the nineties had more than 8 million viewers a week. Um, and it was uh, often the most watched reality show, right? And if you kind of dive into the content, there were like content analysis done of the show and it showed that it was predominantly um, criminals. Uh, that's the way that they're, they're focused on, right? Like people of color um, were the suspects uh, and then the cops were mostly white. And this is at a time when, you know, reality TV was sort of like new and burgeoning. And we didn't know that um, it was actually kind of scripted. We didn't know that um, they were sort of like out there looking for a specific thing and weren't actually just like mirroring reality, but um, showing us what they wanted us to see. Um, and yet those positive, um, and in that case, negative associations um, were force fed to people and strengthened over time and really buttressed their implicit bias against black men. Yeah. So, oh, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead, I'm, gonna, I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> so we're gonna play a quick video that I think just puts a really fine point on um, what we've been talking about. And I hope that it's um, maybe something that you can share with others in your conversation about implicit bias. Junior, can you play that in, in case my audio, I think we're having a, Zoom's having trouble finding my audio output. I sure can. Sorry about that. Implicit bias. Implicit bias. Implicit bias. Bro. 2016 was the year that implicit bias went somewhat mainstream. Yeah, so when Hillary Clinton mentioned implicit bias in the debates, our phones started blowing up, all our friends started emailing us about it. But what is implicit bias? Implicit biases are basically thought processes that happen without you even knowing it. Little mental shortcuts that hold judgments you might not agree with. And sometimes the shortcuts are based on race. First, some clarity. Saying someone has an implicit bias is different from calling someone a racist. The word racist is a highly loaded term, right, here in American society. A lot of times when people are using it, they're thinking of the kind of old fashioned Ku Klux Klan style racist. But implicit bias isn't anywhere near that, you know, explicit. Implicit bias is something that comes out of ordinary mental functioning, out of how the mind normally works. We've all grown up in a culture with media images, news images, conversations we heard at home, our education. Think of that as a fog we've been breathing our whole life. We'd never even realized it, what we were taking in. And that fog causes associations that lead to biases. I somehow know that if you say peanut butter, I'm gonna say jelly. That's an association that's been ingrained in me because throughout my life, peanut butter and jelly are together. And in many forms of media, there is an over-representation of black men and violent crime being paired together. And because of that, I actually deep down inside have been taught that black men are violent and aggressive and not to be trusted, that they're criminals, that they're thugs. With all those associations, I'm not trying to let us off the hook, but in some ways, none of us stood a chance. Starting today, we'll post a video a day dealing with one challenge of understanding implicit bias and its relationship to race and exploring ways we might combat the problem. One more thing, if you're seeing this. Right. Um, so again, I just thought that that put like a more fine point on this discussion. And I hope that, um, I don't know, that video is something that maybe you can 
you can share with others um, as you continue this conversation, hopefully within your organizations. And so all of these discussions we've been having about uh, implicit bias, all this, all these dis discussions about stereotypes and attitudes and associations um, really lead to um, associations like this. You know, there was a, a test done by the American Psychological Association with about 950 participants um, who sort of always judge black men to be larger, more muscular uh, and stronger than white men who were exactly the same size. Uh, and participants also believed that black men were uh, more capable of causing harm uh, in a hypothetical uh, altercation scenario, uh, and that police would be more justified in using force against them, um, even if they were unarmed. And I, I wanna make sure we have time to um, talk about the IETs. Um, so I'm gonna flip ahead and ask Terrence to display a poll because um, I'm curious about which implicit association test you all took. Which implicit and how many people were able to do it beforehand? Which implicit association test did you take? Race, and you can have more than one. Race. And so Terrence, are you able to display that right. poll? What else? Transgender? Age. Yeah, it's it's up. Oh, okay. Weapons. We're taking it. Asian American sexuality and presidents. Let me stop sharing. I can't see it. I can report on the results generic. Okay, sorry. Oh, I see it. I see it. I think let's just take in my computer a, a moment. All right. So pleased to see that so many of you were able to engage with the implicit association test. And you know, really the importance of these um, is to just kind of gauge where we're at with um, bias toward particular groups. Again, as we've been talking about, we've been fed all of these messages about certain groups of people. Um, and I think this is just a really helpful, uh, helpful way to see um, how those messages have uh, been internalized for us um, and how they could manifest for us. Um, so I see most people took um, an IAT dealing with race, which is, Great, because um, that's what we were hoping everybody would do. And then um, it kind of seems like everybody's a bit spread out with um, some of the other ones they were able to take. Um, and, you know, I, I guess as a primer for this discussion, I'll share that um, I try to take these tests fairly often just to see um, how um, my biases may be becoming like more in check um, and how through, um, you know, more cultural understanding, more debiasing techniques, um, I may be um, um, doing away with more of my bias toward um, a particular group. Recently, I took this test and um, and the result was that I um, basically had, um, I, I more favored like light-skinned black people than dark-skinned black people, which was interesting for me. Uh, Cause I grew, I mean, I'm dark-skinned and everybody in my household has my skin tone. <laughs> I, like, I grew up with dark-skinned black people. Um, but, you know, colorism is a real 
seeing and the dominant narratives that we have been fed are, um, you know, kind of centered around this Eurocentric um, notion of beauty um, and Eurocentric beauty standards um, are, uh, have been really predominant uh, in the media uh, as I grew up. Um, <laughs> Jadid said gasp. You know, you all will have um, time to discuss this um, in your upcoming small group. Um, and I guess I just wanted to note that. And I hope that um, during that time, you're sort of able to share how the test was um, experienced for you, uh, if you were sort of surprised by the results. And I hope that what I just shared um, can uh, kind of help you get there. And Terrence, I'm just looking at time and um, know that we need to display a CLE attendance poll. So I wanna make sure to do that before I forget. All right, so again, just as yesterday, um, there is CLE credit being offered for this session. Um, and to receive it, we are gonna display two attendance polls during this session. Um, this is one of two. Um, so just asking you to select um, yes, that you are currently actively participating in this session. Uh, for those of you who are, and I will turn all of these poll results over to Kelly after, um, after our time together. And I invite Kelly to unmute to say anything I may have forgotten to say. But in the interim, I'm going to share my screen again and get us going on. Our next module. Um, thanks for handling the poll, Terrence. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, we are also going to discuss uh, identity anxiety and stereotype threat today. Um, and if you remember from the Gotso Hockett reading that was on your course site, uh, stereotype threat refers to the pressure that people feel when they fear that their performance, their being may confirm a uh, negative stereotype about their group. Um, so if you look at this image, it's sort of from an educational context. So the thought bubbles are all of the association, associations that she thinks people have about um, people who look like her, about young black, girls, right? Um, that they're violent, not good at math, uh, not good at science. Um, and as an example for people of color, you know, for stereotype threat, they fear they may be subject to um, discrimination um, or their performance on a test, for instance, might confirm um, that they are, they're less than. Uh, while white people may fear that they will be judged or uh, perceived as being racist. Um, and you know, when everybody in an interaction is anxious, um, it can turn uh, negative and often does, right? This uh, kind of can cause a bit of a feedback loop where those fears and anxieties um, of both parties um, are kind of undergirding those interactions um, and almost even confirming um, what people thought would happen when they, um, when they began. And so how is this triggered? Um, you know, if I'm uh, a woman or a person of color or me as um, a queer person, like whether it's conscious or not, we are often anticipating bias from people who don't look like us uh, because of our 
racial identity, uh, gender identity, ethnicity, or any other number of identities. Um, and again, from the Gato Hockett article, they mention how uh, within an educational context, like even being asked to fill in your race or gender before you take a test can influence the result negatively. Uh, because on an unconscious level, um, we're just being asked to acknowledge that identity um, before beginning the exercise. And even that uh, can impact us. And another way that it's triggered is, um, you know, working within an organization where the dominant cultural norms are uh, very male or maybe even very white focused. And so what are the impacts of stereotype threat, right? So as we've sort of just said, like, you know, people of color may not perform as well as they could, right? There's sort of uh, less cognitive capacity. Um, so we end up sort of reinforcing a stereotype that we're not good enough, which can lead to a less commitment, lesser commitment to the workplace, um, or even a disassociation from, um, our group that's being stereotyped. Like we don't wanna draw attention to ourselves. So uh, we avoid that group and try to hang out with the more dominant group. And then I wanted to find this concept of identity anxiety that was also mentioned in that article. Um, and you know, our focus today is on race. So we're thinking about this within the context of racial anxiety. Um, and as we see here, this photo really focuses on interracial dialogue, but more broadly, identity anxiety is the sort of discomfort that we experience uh, while we're engaging with people from like any other group. Um, but then for us, for the purposes of this discussion today, identity anxiety comes up during an interracial interaction uh, when race is sort of dropped into it. Um, and, you know, this is triggered by, or how is this being triggered? Um, so for a person of color, they may start to fear that what is coming next may invalidate their experience or identity. They don't get to show up as their true self anymore. Um, and for a white person in that moment, they might start to feel like what they say next um, could make them be perceived as a racist. Uh, and for impact, you know, as this is happening, like your brains can kind of be going into that fight or flight mode, right? Um, uh, your brain sort of shuts down and that can lead to just avoiding the topic altogether, which isn't gonna get us anywhere. Uh, or you head toward the fight and the conversation blows up. Um, and, you know, we do these trainings a lot and have been training more and more on this sort of identity anxiety stereotype threat module. And um, for identity anxiety in particular, uh, what comes up a lot as an example is um, white supervisors maybe feeling like they will be perceived as racist if they share honest feedback with supervisees of color. Um, and so the impact could be that they withhold that feedback, right? Um, which is then terrible because that leads to them not supporting our colleagues of color, um, which we all know then sort of contributes to um, the lack of um, us not being able to retain these attorneys of color on staff because they're not actually receiving supervision, support, um, and the professional development that they need. So how can we push past this? Um, so later today, we're gonna discuss uh, bias mitigation techniques, which is sort of a separate list. Um, but here are some interventions within the context of stereotype threat and identity anxiety. Um, and one thing that works for both categories is diversity and inclusion, right? Just having an environment that is multiracial, multi-identity, um, and so the idea is the more 
queer folks, trans folks, um, black folks, Latinx folks uh, who work with us, the more exposure we have to other cultures and the less threatened we feel by those identities. And just wanna note that the um, inclusion part is really, really important here. Uh, and I feel like it's often really missed um, in our discussions around like equity, equality, uh, and diversity. Uh, Inclusion is really important because we want to make sure that um, we're not just hiring uh, black people or people of color or people with you know those different identities for different positions in our office. We want to make sure that we're hiring those people for key positions at our senior management level, um, that they are reflected in our board. Um, because what we wanna see is people of, uh, with these sort of different identities, people of color, is that we wanna see that our voices are valued um, and are welcome at those tables and at those spaces. So the inclusion part is really, really important. Um, and so another intervention is self-awareness, uh, really just to recognize where we get triggered personally. Uh, it's good to be aware of where this could come up for us to take a first step um, at trying to counteract that. Uh, so for self-awareness under identity anxiety, um, you know, we, the reason that we focus on the structural dimensions of racism in the Racial Justice Institute is that uh, as a racialized society, we have to recognize that some of us have privileges. Uh, so recognizing that white people have a certain level of privilege and benefit from walking through the world with that identity. Um, so important for each of us to understand where our identity might give us those privileges um, or where it might mean that um, we, um, are on the receiving end or are a victim of bias. Um, and, you know, really recognizing that white fragility is um, sort of a real thing. Um, so it's sort of a self-reflection, a self-reflective process where, of where you are in this system um, and what have you been taught about people who don't look like you and how are you bringing that with you as you walk through the world? And I wanna dive more deeply into this notion of wise feedback that is listed under stereotype threat. Um, so found this, um, you know, when we give wise feedback, um, we want to convey both our high standards and a confidence that an individual um, can meet the expectations that we're sharing. Uh, and from there, we can focus on next steps together. Um, so for instance, how can you as a supervisor just kind of just help them get there, right? And if you look down forward to general feedback guidelines, um, you wanna be providing contemporaneous feedback. This is a really big one that we teach in our um, supervision, for quality and impact, and I guess even our sort of leadership course to some extent. Um, but you know you want to make sure that as a supervisor you're giving contemporaneous feedback, you're giving simultaneous feedback um, because you don't want to end up in a situation where um, somebody who reports to you uh, is surprised during their performance evaluation. Um, we sort of hear time and time again that um, you can get to this point with performance evaluations where um, you know, it's basically like when people do get brought up for performance evals, like they're sort of always seen as uh, punitive. Um, so we wanna be just offering feedback consistently so that even the uh, evaluation process itself just feels kind of normalized and we're used to having those discussions. Um, and they understand that it comes from uh, you being supportive of them and wanting to um, again, convey those high standards because you know that they can get there. And be specific about what you're commenting on. And that really plugs right into providing contemporaneous feedback, um, just so the conversation or the, that sort of moment is fresh on everybody's mind. 
Um, sometimes when you get feedback and it's been six months, like it's just a little foggy for you and it can be hard for you to kind of get back to that moment and see it from the other person's perspective um, as you're trying to actively remember it. Uh, and finally, adopt a growth mindset. Uh, and that's really believing and saying that we can change, right? Uh, we are continually working toward being our best self. We can change the ways that our brain interprets information. Our brains are malleable instruments and through effort and hard work, we can maximize our potential. We can learn new things. We can think in new ways. It just takes time and effort. Uh, and that's juxtaposed here with this sort of fixed mindset, right? Um, where we can't grow beyond our current thinking. So if I'm racist or biased, I'll always be that way. If I'm not inclined toward science or math or um, some sort of particular skill set um, in the office, then you know I'll sort of always be that way. And so I wanna give you all an opportunity to um, just kind of flesh this out in a small group setting um, before we come back to debrief and discuss it more as a large group. Um, and so here are some prompts that are listed for you all. Um, we're actually gonna share, let me stop sharing now. Because we have a Google Doc for you, which Terrence will share in the chat pod. Um, and so if you all could go to this Google Doc with me, just wanna show you. Okay, I'm seeing people come in in the 50s. Just gonna pause and give more people a minute to, to sort of join me here. Um, and if you wanna undock the chat pod, um, just move down to the bottom of your Zoom screen and it's kind of at the bottom middle, there's that chat icon. If you click on that, it should pull it up for you. And, and the Google Doc link should be there. Um, and so really, you know, all that's here in this Google Doc for this small group is your um, small group prompts, um, sort of all suggested. These are triads, so there should just be three of you um, in each of these groups. Um, so you may wanna start with some introductions if you don't know each other share your name, pronouns, or title, uh, and then um, you can maybe share your general reactions to the IATs that you took, um, any general reactions you have to the material on identity, anxiety, and stereotype. Um, move on to identifying how it might show up for you in your relationships with clients, with those that you work with. Has it happened before? Do you wanna share um, a story of how it's happened before, but maybe now you have the language to discuss it in more detail. And then uh, ultimately move on to um, just kind of sharing how any of the techniques that we just discussed might help you mitigate that bias. And this is just a document that holds your prompts. You don't have to type into this because um, there's only one for everybody. Um, I just wanted to make sure everybody knew that what we were doing together. Um, but then want to point out that, so prompts are on page one. And if you keep scrolling down, I just quickly cut and pasted the interventions that I just mentioned um, and the wise feedback list, uh, just as a reference. Um, once you get to the part where you're discussing um, how to mitigate identity anxiety and stereotype threat. Terrence, are we all set on small groups? Yeah, just I uh, need just about a minute, generic, just to make sure everybody's in a room here. Okay. All right, and we you're gonna have about I'm gonna say twelve minutes for this. Um, but I'm hoping that just because there's about three of you in each group, you'll, you know, be able to discuss a couple of these points. You won't be able to do everything. 
um, but I hope you have some room to just kind of flesh this out and share with your colleagues. And just about 10 more seconds. I just have to move one more person here. Okay, I think we're ready, generic. Yeah. All right, does anybody have any questions about the small group activity? All right, well, we will see you back in the main room in just a little bit and we'll be sure to broadcast a message when you have about five minutes left, um, just as a courtesy. All right, talk to y'all soon. Um, I have just I have one person drop out. Hang on just one more second here. Make sure I have enough people in each group. All right, here we go. I think we're at about a quarter of the participants. Over a hundred. All right, so welcome back everybody. Um, I hope that you all had some fruitful small group discussion. Um, I wish that we had more time to hear from each and every one of you, um, but I'm just kind of wondering how your small group discussion went. Um, like, I guess even if you may wanna share from your personal perspective of, um, any reactions you had to the IAT test, uh, the materials around um, stereotype threat or identity anxiety, um, or any ways that you thought it could be a helpful frame um, to help mitigate, um, to mitigate identity anxiety or stereotype threat uh, within, your, uh, within your program. I'm willing to share my um, response to the IAT test. This is Natalie. Hey there. Um, uh, it's funny, I had read about it a ways back, so I was aware of what it was and like how it was supposed to be measuring things. And I had taken it maybe two years ago and um, I was pretty sure that I would, you know, get a good result that I was pleased with. Um, and instead it showed, it showed a strong bias against the African-Americans. And I was like, what? <laughs> um, but, you know, I expected that. I mean, I didn't really, but I knew it could happen. And I hadn't even taken it again until today. I have to admit, I didn't have time to finish all of the homework and I was hurrying to, to at least get one under my belt. Um, and I scored much better. So like, I don't know if I was thinking too hard the first time or you know, I've been doing a lot of different trainings, you know, I've been having a lot more, doing a lot more thinking about it. So this time I was only slightly preferential towards white, <laughs> but that's, yeah. I mean, that's better than it was, but it was, it was really interesting. I wasn't sure what to Yeah, thank you so much, Natalie, um, for sharing that with us. And, you know, yeah, I think, uh, working through these biases and um, kind of really changing the way that we've been taught to think takes uh, time and work. Uh, I'm glad that it's going in the right direction for you. Um, but, um, you know, I just think to highlight the sort of time that it took um, for you to get from one place to the other, you know, I, I think our results are going to be incremental. But um, I do think that again, this sort of implicit association test is just a really good way for us to just kind of gauge where we're at. Uh, and so, as I said, you know, I, I just try to take them periodically just to, I don't know. I'm definitely gonna do that. And I wasn't aware whenever I took it, they didn't have other options for other things like gender. Um, and I'm really excited to go back and like take all of them. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Anybody else want to share anything? Okay. 
Okay. Um, well, we have plenty to cover. Um, so I guess I will move on. Um, Terrence, I think actually this would be a good point to go ahead and do the final attendance poll. As I share my slides. Um, so everybody, this is gonna be um, CLE credit attendance poll two of two. Uh, if you could take this for us, and again, I will forward this information to Kelly um, so that she can make sure you get credit uh, for attending today's course. As we do that. All right, so we will leave that poll up for a bit. Um, um, but now we are going to move on to discuss uh, mitigating bias. And, you know, one of the first things that I've really wanted to cover, um, which is kind of a part of our systems thinking module and in, in RJI, um, is that, you know, when we think about bias mitigation, we really have to think about it in relation to this notion of choice points, right? So choice points are discretionary places in the decision-making process where our bias can creep in and create uh, a disparate racial outcome. Uh, so whether conscious or not, our biases influence decisions in our orgs around who our vendors are, who we hire, who gets promoted, who gets which cases uh, and so forth. And so just like our road here, choice points are decision-making points where we can go left or right. Uh, so if we can begin to better name the parts of a process, we can analyze it and examine how to mitigate bias to prevent those inequitable outcomes. And later, we will go back into small groups um, and you know, really kind of discuss choice points within a hiring context um, and use some techniques and pick ways that we can um, just kind of debias the process at different steps. So you know, the first thing that we have to do to mitigate bias is really rethink our framework around bias. So there's this old framework um, that we've been taught where um, you know prejudice is bad. So if you have any kind of prejudice, uh, you have any kind of bias, then you must be a bad person. Uh, but really we all have biases uh, because again, we've been fed these dominant narratives about uh, in-groups and out-groups our entire lives and it influences how we view the world. So we're gonna have to move to a new framework, right? Where we understand that prejudiced thoughts and actions are ingrained habits um, that we all have. And breaking these habits requires uh, more than good intentions. We're gonna have to work for it a bit. And what we know about implicit bias is that it's really increased by a lot of the ways that we've unfortunately been taught to work, right? We've been taught to work under um, increasing amounts of stress under a lot of time pressure uh, while we're multitasking. I'm sure that a lot of our um, job descriptions uh, for the jobs that we have right now um, sort of noted that we must have the ability to multitask. Um, but we know that that increases the chances of implicit bias um, sort of seeping into your different organizational processes. Uh, a lack of clear criteria for decision making um, ambiguous or incomplete information around a task. Um, and again, lack of familiarity with a group. And we know that implicit bias is not reduced by just being well-meaning, having good intentions, um, just somebody else telling you to reduce your bias. Um, that's not really a tool, right? 
um, just suppressing your bias and avoiding it, like we talked about earlier, avoiding people from other groups um, so that you don't have to think about it at all. And then, you know, it's also not reduced by just thinking you don't have bias. And so the good news is that our brains are malleable and with proper awareness and other techniques, we can actually mitigate bias. Um, and debiasing techniques are designed to interrupt the decision-making process at that subconscious level, that unconscious level where bias resides. So the hope is that when bias is triggered, we become aware of it, we are motivated to correct the bias, we become aware of the impact and the magnitude of the bias, um, and we apply an appropriate debiasing strategy which leads to more equitable outcomes. So here are the sort of four buckets that our interventions fall within. There's awareness and motivation, environment, exposure, and then procedural changes. And so under awareness and motivation, you know, really the starting point for any debiasing is implicit bias training, like what we're doing right now. Um, because again, once we know we have a particular bias, we can begin to sort of monitor it and check ourselves in those moments when we are um, maybe sort of interacting with somebody from that group. I'm sorry, I'm trying to... Terrence, can you mute? that person. I'm trying, but I'm unable to. Thank you so much. Um, and so, you know, moving on, um, uh, also, you know, practicing mindfulness, just being present and aware of what's really happening around us, um, paying attention and not letting our brain run on auto autopilot so that we continue to make those um, assumptions about groups of people um, and stereotype. Cultural intelligence and understanding. Um, just being willing to hear and learn from other cultures other than our own uh, and being open to really listen to people uh, and hear people who don't look like us. Environment also matters. Uh, think about the images we typically see in law schools and courtrooms and how they reinforce dominant culture. Um, think about the kinds of pictures that clients see on our walls? Are they um, seeing themselves as empowered? Are our marketing materials focusing on them as empowered? Um, are our marketing materials in, in their language? Um, how are we really uh, portraying them? You know, just really briefly, um, I kind of started out working in the social justice realm, working for Mississippi Center for Justice. Um, I was a communications associate there um, kind of many moons ago, but then sort of post uh, Katrina advocacy, right? And we had this photographer um, tag along with our attorneys um, to uh, intakes for people who were, had been you know, victims of Hurricane Katrina. Um, and so we ended up with this beautifully shot photography um, and of course our attorneys looked great, right? But then our clients had really just been through one of the biggest tragedies in their life and lost everything. So, you know, we had photos of our attorneys and button ups and slacks and they looked great. And then our clients on the other hand had like babies with soggy diapers and um, you know, their hair was um, probably not looking in, the way that they would normally like to present themselves, really just all around. Um, and so we had a discussion um, and did a bit of a photo inventory um, to just kind of consider what it would be like for um, our clients of color to come into our offices and see those images and to see themselves depicted in that way um, and decided to just remove all of that photography. Um, and just kind of start over because ultimately we just thought that we weren't portraying our clients in the best light. Um, and so that's sort of what we're talking about here when we talk about environment. 
exposure matters also. Um, just having peer-to-peer -peer contact across a diverse group working toward a common goal helps mitigate bias. Um, so this is a collage of RJI 2020, and sort of all of their beautiful diverse faces. Um, and, you know, we pull in um, this cohort as um, equity teams, basically. So this year we had 14 equity teams and each regional team is sort of working together on uh, an initiative toward a common goal. Um, and that's um, sort of the best model for this intergroup contact, which I think really kind of speaks to the inclusion model that we've been talking about. Uh, you know, I, we recently rebranded at the Shriver Center and I got to be on our rebranding panel with um, members of our board, um, people um, in you know, high positions within our organization, sort of all coming together for a collective conversation about what the Schreiber Center uh, meant for us from our vantage point. Um, so whatever way that you can um, kind of blend these groups together and kind of like leave your titles at the door to kind of come together and work on a common project. Under exposure, there's also stereotype replacement. Um, so, you know, this strategy really involves replacing stereotypical responses with non-stereotypical responses, um, which is shown to be helpful. So here we have a black doctor, um, a female auto mechanic. Um, and then on the left, I don't know how many people may have seen this like social media campaign, but this is a photo of a father who was basically tired of having to change his baby like this in public restrooms. Um, and so he started this squat for change movement um, to get um, a conversation started about public architecture and public spaces, um, just really um, trying to negate the stereotype that only women are taking care of babies, like that men need changing tables in the restrooms because they are having to do things like this just to help take care of their kids. So here's another example of um, counter stereotyping. Like how often do you walk into a nail salon and see um, mostly Asian clientele uh, being serviced by um, white women? And then this image of, uh, of white cleaning staff. And here's one last one uh, on the left. Like how often do you walk into a store and see only black dolls available, right? And then somebody pushed us even farther and um, kind of encouraged us to look for an image of um, maybe a, a boy selecting a doll. So again, it's just sort of like breaking these molds, breaking these constructs and thinking outside of the box. And then finally, um, there are these procedural changes, right? So uppermost left, there's perspective taking. So getting diverse perspectives from somebody who doesn't look like you. And you know, diversity logic teaches us that when we work across a diverse group, we can better issue spot and problem solve. Uh, and then the second one, individuate. Uh, don't sort people into categories. Instead, see someone for who they are outside of a stereotype and really listen to and hear their input. Reduce cognitive load by just slowing down and taking small bites. Um, and then deliberative processing, slow down and make time to seek input from others. And really think about how you can add it to your process, um, how to work it into your calendars. Like if you are um, on a hiring committee do your interviews need to be an hour long? Maybe your interviews are 45 minutes long and it gives you 15 minutes after each person you see to be able to just um, talk to the other members of your hiring committee. Uh, at the Shriver Center, I mean, we really overhauled our hiring practice um, in aid of uh, employing more diverse candidates, which has really been helpful. And we've done things like, um, you know, uh, just really sketch out um, a map of what it looks like 
for uh, us to hire new people at the Shriver Center. And one of the things that we do is basically, so we make sure that there is a diverse hiring committee, right? Uh, and that they are coming together beforehand to get everybody's opinion about like what the questions are that we're gonna ask that person. We ask standardized or each applicant really, we ask the same questions of each applicant um, and we um, have a time limit for each interview. And um, you know, we can only meet for each person for like one hour. So it's just that kind of pausing um, and um, really sketching out a consistent process uh, to make sure that our biases can't seep in and create that racialized outcome that we're trying to prevent. Making sure that there's fair and clear criteria. Uh, when criteria for important decisions are vague or subjective, we risk letting bias seep in. Um, and then finally, accountability. Um, just add accountability to your process. Um, I feel like this is sort of a step that we kind of often skip. Um, but if we think we may have to explain our decisions, we're more motivated to act in an unbiased or debiased way. Uh, so again, you know, we've made all of these changes to our hiring processes. And now at the Shriver Center, like after a hire is made, um, our HR department uh, emails the entire org with um, information about that process, like how many people applied, how many people were interviewed, who participated as a part of the interviewing committee. Um, it's just an attempt at transparency, I think, and trying to hold yourself accountable to the standards that you have um, put together around a process. So, I want to pause here, you know, we're going to move into small groups in just a little bit and um, kind of deconstruct the hiring process um, and try to apply these debiasing techniques to those different points in the process. Um, so I want to start here by just having you all brainstorm as many choice points as you can in the hiring process. Like where are those discretionary points um, where individuals have to make decisions and their biases could seep in and um, create unfair racialized outcomes? All right, you guys are doing great. They're pouring in. Writing a job description. How and where a job opening is posted. Yep. Who's on the committee? Yep. Who would interview? Right, who selects those people? What do we tell them about the job, right? What goes into the, what goes into the job description? Person to person recruiting by staff. Mm -hmm. That's a big one, Chris. Um, I forget which bank, I mean, I think it was like Wells Fargo that was sort of recently under, under fire for a lack of diversity and inclusion on their staff and basically, you know, the excuse, the, the old adage is, you know, um, well, we can't find diverse candidates to hire, which, you know, that's not, that's not really true. Like if you can't find them, you're not looking for them. Um, so yeah, yeah, that one comes up a lot. Um, all right, these are great, these are great. Um, so I'm going to flip forward. I just want to make sure that you have enough time to work in small groups. And so, you know, these are the ones that we came with, came up with. Um, some of you also already mentioned job description, uh, advertising and outreach. Like, where do we post the job? Um, description, the job description, um, which sort of falls under hiring criteria. Um, the resume review, who does the initial screening and what does that process look like? Right. Oh, and Jolene also mentions um, checking references here, which is a really important one. So again, I um, want to make sure that we have time to work in small groups um, and kind of flesh out this exercise. So in a moment, we are going to put you back into small groups. We're going to use the same Google Doc that um, 
we worked on before. And I see Terrence has posted that into the chat pod. So if you all wanna join me there, um, basically each one of your groups is gonna have a separate um, sheet to work in, in Google. So I'm trying to get there myself. So let's see, I've got about 90 people in here with me, which is good. So if you scroll down to group one, debiasing hiring worksheet, um, just to look at this one as an example, you know, on the far left are those decision points that we just worked through. Uh, hiring criteria, resume review, interview questions. Um, so, you know, those are just sort of some of the points in the process. So would kind of start at, um, you know, any point that you all decide that you want to work on and share how bias shows up there. Um, and then using, da, 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 sorry, let me drop this into the chat pod. Using, I can't share this PDF for some reason. I'm sorry, team. Well, while that propagates. Um, so, you know, basically you're just going left to right, right? Picking a decision point, sharing how bias might show up there, and then um, trying to pick from that, that pick list of debiasing techniques that we just uh, reviewed um, to share how one of those techniques might mitigate bias at that step. Gosh. Okay. And Terrence, I don't know if you have any more specific instructions about small groups. Um, I just shared in the chat pod with you all. Um, it's basically a, a sister worksheet to the one that you have in Google. It's just a little bit more information and actually lists the techniques that we just reviewed on the first page, if that's helpful as a reference. Yeah, I'll just remind folks that once you get into, when I start the groups, you're going to have to determine which group you are in. And just like yesterday, uh, if you do not see on the left side of the document, if you do not see an index, you just want to click that icon, document icon in the top left. When you do, you're going to get an index over on the left group one, group two, group three, et cetera. When I put you right now in the Zoom meeting, when you look up at the top gray bar, it says Zoom meeting. You see it in that white box. When I put you into your breakout, it's going to tell you which breakout room you're in. In this example, it's breakout room two. So you would then back at the document, you would just click on group two. So you first determine which group you're in once I start the breakouts and then click on the uh, associated number in the Google Doc. And then you'll work on that part of the worksheet. There's about five people in each group. And I think we're gonna give them uh, 10 to 12 minutes, Eric. I think we're running a little behind. So we'll that give you about right. 10 to 12 minutes because we wanna have enough time for our debrief when you come back. Yeah, so maybe just pick one um, place in the process. And I guess just one last logistical note. Um, I mean, the groups are random, but you'll likely be in this group with different people than you were the first time. All right, and I'll start the groups now and I'll send messages to let you know how you're doing on time. I'll start the groups now.
<laughs> All right. Folks are trickling in. I saw a lot of um, great thoughts being shared in the Google Doc. And I think, I mean, at the very least, we have time to hear from a group. I wish there was more time. All right, we are at over 120 participants. I think that's most of the group um, and also being conscious of time. Um, so again, I saw a lot being shared in the Google Doc um, and just kind of wanted to invite maybe one representative from one team to sort of share what you all talked about. Um, what choice point you picked, um, where the bias could show up there, and then maybe even um, the biasing technique you chose to apply. I can, I can talk. I'm Osana. Okay. Hey there. Okay, I'm, we were in group three and they're great ladies. Um, I wish we had more time to talk. It was really fun, but um, <laughs> we went with assessment of need. Um, and what we pointed out was that sometimes um, you have you have roles where you know people are overworked and they have let's like, say you have an attorney who's got twice as many cases of, as everyone else. However, when her hiring manager looks at it and her much because of her biases or their biases, all they say is, "Oh, that person's just incompetent," or "That person um, just needs to work faster," or "That person is just not doing what they're supposed to do." Um, at the same time, when you look at it, she's got way more cases than everyone else. And no one's looking at that. So her, so her calls for help or relief are ignored. Um, so, and that's all based on that hiring manager's biases. Um, and another one was um, one where we had um, management ass assessing the needs of, an or of, of a department where, um, where the people in that department didn't really have a say in that. Um, and so one thing we came up with as an intervention would be to avoid top, top down management. Uh, make sure that assessment of need um, of needs is inclusive. I'm sorry, inclusive of of all of more than just management. Um, and in the needs of that particular attorney who needs help and not getting it or being ignored, maybe having an outside someone above or someone on the same level or above that person or that hiring manager taking a look at those cases or reviewing those cases to make sure that everyone has an even amount of cases across the board. And then you'll see if you level everyone out, then you'll see there's all these extra cases based on that. So, yeah. I think that's great. And I think you pointed out something important also, because, you know, often it's just about um, putting some sort of process in place and just mm -hmm. making sure that we are doing that same thing consistently across the organization. Because I think that's the piece that we often miss. And then you kind of pointed to it also when you mentioned, um, basically talked about the lack of support that this mm -hmm. employee has, right? Um, and we wanna to get to the place where we're offering everybody the same support and we understand everybody's workload in the same way. And we can't do that unless we're applying the same metric to every person, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, um, so I know we're at time, but for those of you who might be able to stay for a couple more minutes, I'm open to hearing from another group. Thank you so much. Aww. What would you say your name was? My Osana. Osana. Thank you so much, Osana. Sure. This is Linda Mussolini. I don't remember my group number, but one of the things we kind of focused on advertising and outreach mm -hmm. and how difficult it is to actually advertise in places or even reach out to fellow agencies or individuals to find people that are qualified for the jobs that you're actually posting and looking for. And that was very challenging sometimes. When you say it's difficult to reach out to that, can you describe that a little bit more? One of the individuals who was specifically talking about it said he actually made personal phone calls to colleagues in other places and tried to spread the word on the job opportunity. And they just got no applicants. They just weren't able to find the people that met the criteria they were looking for. And advertising on Indeed was not ideal because that didn't really yield anything either. So it was very challenging for them to hire for their positions. Yeah. And you know, um, 
I think what some people have found to be helpful is to basically always be searching for candidates, um, which I know sounds like a lot of work, but um, I think it's about where you want to disperse the work, if that makes sense. Um, so, you know, maybe it's about um, trying to plug into um, job fairs earlier on, or, you know, making sure that you have connections with um, um, law schools and the, um, you know, different sort of like groups and association that um, diverse candidates may belong to within these other law schools and, and spaces. Um, but I hear you. Um, I guess I just wanted to share like something I heard that had um, sort of been applied to work there. But in terms of a debiasing technique, like did you pick one that might help in that instance? Well, I think it would be good if there were national resources for groups or publications to advertise in that specifically have audiences of the demographics that you're looking at. We didn't really quite get that far, but that's what I would like to see because I know where I worked before we would, it was a community college. So they would advertise in the community college publications and things like that for positions. But it would be really nice if there was some sort of organization where you could go that would list the publications in your area to reach out to certain demographics or people in certain fields, because that would be much more individualized and it would be targeting the demographics you really, really want. And I think it's real hard to do that these days. Yeah, I mean, and it could be, you know, some kind of process that you all insert into your planning process where it's, it basically becomes your hiring manager's job to try to accumulate whatever this list is that you need to be able to reach out to when you do have a hire. Like even though, you know, you may not always be hiring, um, just kind of building up that resource so that when it is time, um, you can send it out to uh, a more diverse group. All right, well, I know that we are over time. Um, sorry to have kept you over today, um, but I hope that people found this session uh, helpful. I hope that you um, will kind of continue to use these materials as you think about um, you know, your interactions internally with your coworkers and where your bias um, or even their bias may be um, seeping in um, to create unfair and disparate racialized outcomes. Um, as a follow-up, we will definitely send you the, um, the debiasing worksheet um, just to make sure that you have that, that hard copy um, which again kind of mirrors the, the Google Doc that you just worked on, but it has a little bit more, more detail. Um, and I think Could the PowerPoints or the other materials for both today and yesterday's sessions be sent out to participants? That would be really helpful. Yeah, we can work on that. I'll work with Kelly on that. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure what sort of follow-up she had planned, but um, we can send it to her. And again, everybody definitely be, I'm gonna save this chat and I'll comb it for people who are interested in the Racial Justice Institute. Um, but if you um, enjoyed this conversation and you know might be interested in applying with some of your colleagues to join us there, um, definitely reach out. Sorry, I'm trying to share my email address in the chat pod. There we go. All right, um, uh, be safe everybody. Um, you know, COVID is real, mask up. Um, and best, best of luck to all of us next week. Um, and again, we'll uh, work with Kelly to follow up and um, send, you know, PowerPoints and recordings and, and such to everybody. All right. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all.